Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Peace Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. Today we have Kyron Pearson coming in from Boston. He's a former uh, Voluntary Virtues Network show host. Um, his show is called Kyron Pearson and Friends. Um, he took a t some time off to, to go down to New Mexico, learn about... Um, how to build earthships, and uh, he's going to talk a little bit about that, and uh, you know, hopefully he'll go back to uh, starting up some of his own shows again, because uh, Lord knows we need more voluntarist messages <laughs> coming out there on the uh, on the internet, right? It's not, it's, uh, you can never have enough, right? <laughs> so, uh, so maybe we'll start with Kyron. Um, how did you become an anarchist? And also, um, uh, I remember your anarchist anarchist interview about you, know, you talked about your the way you uh, interesting way you pay your taxes. <laughs> Definitely get into that. <laughs> yeah, um, and so, I'm, so I pay my taxes in, in pennies. I'll start there. Right, um, no <laughs> pay my taxes in pennies. Got arrested for trying to do so for for trespassing on a public building. Even though I was there doing business hours, uh, they didn't want to accept the payment, and I ended up getting arrested. I'm actually going to do it again. Hopefully, you know, there'll be more people who actually want to do it with me as well and, uh, you know, pay all our, our, our taxes in City Hall you know, with pennies. So uh, come out. I'm, I'm going to I've already made the event, but I don't know if I'll be able to gather a sufficient amount of pennies to, to do so at the time. So uh, but I'm, I'm gathering if, if you can gather as well and you want to come out, gather as many pennies you can come down and, and pay uh, your access. <laughs> in Boston City Hall uh, on, on the date, you know, that, yeah. that we decide upon. But uh, just be in contact with me. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let people know when, when that's going to happen. But how I became an anarchist is uh, I don't I, I watched a lot of Discovery Channel, you know, and I guess it's sort of the same way I became an, an atheist. It's, it's this thought process, this logic process, right? You know, the, you watch these animals that do essentially all the things that we do, but, you know, they tell you, oh, well, you know, it's a bonobo, it's a chimpanzee, it's a gazelle, it's not going to heaven because it's an animal and you're not an animal, but then you look at yourself and you look at, you know, your mother and your father, like, they're, they're animals, I'm an animal, you know, I breastfeed from a mother just like this, this baby gazelle is doing on his mother, you know, and... You know, you, you realize that you're just an animal, too. And, and because of that, we're not really special. There's no divinity uh, about us. There's nothing that differentiates us really from the from the other animals on the planet. Uh, other than the fact that we do our our fangs, our claws, our camouflage is the fact that we have this really large brain and it allows us to be highly adaptable. Um, so, you know, you. That same reasoning process got me to, to anarchism. Uh, you know, people saying, well, you know, the police are there to protect you. Well, then why is it that I feel unsafe every time there's a cop behind us in the car and you're freaking out, dad or mom? Like, sit down, put on your seatbelt. Like, you don't seem very calm and you don't sound protected. Like, so, you know, you, you, uh, you deal with the, the contrast, the, the cognitive dissonance that you know, we, we all are sort of subjected to uh, when we when, when these ideas, these, these conflicting ideas clash. And uh, and so like that, that's what led me there. Just just logical, just being logical, listening to the to the little voice in your head that, that tells you like this shit isn't right. I mean, it takes you a while to do it. I, I, I didn't become an anarchist until I was 29. So and it was just finally just all the, the veils had dropped around me. Um, got injured. You know, I think a lot of people reach uh, anarchism through some kind of uh, trauma. And my trauma was I had a really bad back injury and I couldn't walk for a really long time. And I get to thinking and reflecting and uh, about my life, about, you know, the world we live in. And I think that was really, you know, what helped me reach anarchism. You know, one of my favorite heroes, uh, she rose is, is Harriet Tubman. And uh, she was slave on a plantation and her slave master uh, threw a, a iron, like an actual iron and hit her in the head with the iron. And that, and that trauma sort of snapped her out of uh, being like slave minded and realizing that, hey, look, I'm a slave on the plantation. I got to get the hell out of here. Um, so uh, and then also too on, on Jeff Berg's show, and, and, and I really hold to this, is speaking Spanish and fishing 
helped me become an anarchist because like understanding the history of people like there wasn't always game wardens to like check and see if you had a fishing license like people went out they fished they risked their lives to go out into the river or to the ocean to go catch some food for themselves and uh and that was <laughs> that's the, the story of man for for thousands of years before you know the state came along and decided, hey, look, you can't survive unless we give you permission to survive out of nature. So that's uh, fishing and, and speaking Spanish. You know, it opens your world, opens your worldview. You get to speak to to people uh, in different places where there really isn't that many police, and 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 in places where they're not police, you you really feel you really feel free. I mean, I'm back here in Boston. And all I've been hearing is sirens, and I, I can't remember any sirens in Mexico, none. And and it's just it it creates something inside of you, and it you know it, it when you live in different places, just being able to speak the language allowed me to live in places where I was exposed to what it's like to not be feeling like I'm in a police state. Yeah, that's true. You know, we we get used to living in a certain way, and then uh, once you step out of that, you know, you kind of you're shaken. You're, you're you you wake up a little bit. <laughs> you're like, wait a minute, the whole world doesn't live like this. <laughs> right, reverse, reverse reverse culture shock is what they call it. When you come back home and you're like, whoa, this is this is some really. I grew up in this. This is normal. This was normal to me. And so yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, well, let, let, tell me what um, any personalities or books um, that influenced you the most in, in your development. Uh, as as a, as an anarchist, yeah. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I can't say any books. I, I watched a lot of TV. I, I'm from the sort of the TV generation when. Mm -hmm. Cable TV had come out, and I watched a lot of Discovery Channel, like I said, a lot of Animal Planet, a lot of History Channel. I think when you really understand sort of history, I, I would say most anarchists have a really good understanding of the history of man and historical events. Um, and just understanding the, the continuous thread of the initiation of force and what that has meant uh, for, for human beings and, and, and having a monopoly on the initiation of force, a monopoly on force and what that has meant for people. And, uh, and, and so, you know, being exposed to, to those things, I think really helps. I was kind of a nerd in, in a weird way in, in school. I didn't really read books. I just, I would, my dad bought us a set of encyclopedias when I was, uh, in about the sixth grade. And I literally would just like flip through them in order to read about all the animal stuff I could. But, you know, it was like the Internet back then for me. Like you would, you would see something interesting, you would start reading about it. And, you know, that's, that's what I did. I literally would sit down for hours and just flip through the encyclopedia. And, uh, you know, if, if there was any book I read, um, that was it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I myself also did a lot of reading, and I, I understand that you know one of the things about volunteerists is that you know most volunteers are well read. <laughs> you know, most people don't just like wake up and you know recognize you know taxation is theft, coercion is not consent. <laughs> you know, these are things that <laughs> these are things that you really have to study to internalize and understand because they go so contrary to the propaganda that we're all fed in uh, in right. our government schooling, right? Right. And uh, it's, it's funny, I'm actually reading now The Pitfalls of, of, of Language. Uh, I, I forget the exact title, but it, it covers like logical fallacies. And in the opening of the book, uh, the author says that language is the only way that you can actually think. Like thought exists only because language exists. So if there was no language, we couldn't have thought. So because of which most of us don't understand or have access or have never been exposed to the language of liberty. So like, you know, when somebody was like voluntarism, you're like, well, what's voluntarism? Or like, what's statism? And you went and actually looked it up because you knew you didn't know the word. And like most people don't, they just skim right over and like, fuck it, I don't, I don't know what that means. I don't care. Uh, but I think once you get exposed to those words and those concepts, once you know and understand them, then like you have no choice but to become a voluntarist. I actually made a post today. It was like if you if you or yesterday I believe you actually think you 
understand the concept of voluntarism and you're not a, a voluntarist, either you're a fucking liar <laughs> or you're a fucking psychopath. You don't really get a choice. There's no middle ground. Like if you're claiming you really understand this concept, then like those are your two options. Just let me know which it is. And I, that would be great. Right. <laughs> It's like, it's like it's like if you're a slave master, and then one day you wake up. You know what? Slavery is immoral, but now nah, I'll just I'll just continue <laughs> my slave master. Return. Right. <laughs> it's like well, well, you're an immoral person, right? You've either realized that or you you're just you you have it, right? Yeah, yeah. And it, go ahead. No, no. I was just gonna say that the, that's fundamentally what, in my mind, um, what politicians. Are um, many of them, um, you know, are the what drives them is a lack of empathy, because you know, it, it's it's you know it's hard to say that you know some of them, if some of them you know really believe what they're saying or they're just economically ignorant or they're just stupid, <laughs> you know, it's hard to say. But um, either way, the the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? So even saying I had good intentions when I killed the person. <laughs> you know, it's still, or when I enslaved, you know, millions of people, you're still enslaving millions of people, right? You know, regardless if you're, you're ignorant or not. So that to me calls the question, you know, um, is it is it necessary to have the throne of power for people to use and and in the process, you know, damage and hinder the freedom of millions of people, right? Well, you know, it, it's funny you 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 bring it that this is a great transition, I think, into uh, what Walter the Walter Block interview um, that happened on Anarchast uh, recently, when you know Walter Block, Mister Libertarian, uh, self-proclaimed anarcho-capitalist, is saying that you know he supports Rand Paul. And it's like, okay, do you fucking understand what these concepts really mean, right? Will the ends justify the means, right? If I'm saying that theft is always wrong <laughs> in any shape or form, and all the things that violate the NAP are, are a form of theft, that's it. It's just theft, right? So it just basically do not steal, steal by defraud, steal by murdering, steal by, you know, stealing, um, and assaulting and, and like raping, like don't steal. Like you, all those are forms of, of theft, right? And so, like, if you do, you do you understand those concepts, right? And if you do, then how is it that you're you're going to advocate that theft happens in order for you to get a candidate in that you think has the same politics as you, but doesn't because he's actually running for office? Because in order for him to get into office. He's going to receive stolen money and he's going to decide how to spend stolen money. You know, he's participating in his own enslavement and the enslavement of others unless he gets in and denounces his pay and then just completely shuts down government. Like. The, yeah, you're, you're not an you're you're not an anarchist, right? Like you, you're just not. And that's not going to Rand Paul's not going to get in office tomorrow if he becomes a president and just say you know what everything shut down government the the the, the militaries were, were were drawing all the troops all the arms are going to you know anybody who wants them you can take them you can homestead all this government land out west out east wherever we have land shit's not gonna happen right it's just not because the u.s empire of what around 800 military bases scattered throughout the world, you know, the, the petrodollar backed by the might of the U.S. military, that's just going to vanish, right? <laughs> it's just going to go up in smoke. In it, in it, <laughs> they're just going right? to just just willingly give it up. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, yeah. and the other thing is, you know, yeah, I, I have heard that argument. A lot of people say, you know, it's the Lysander Spoon argument that, that voting, you know, if you're, um, if you're voting, it's not necessarily means that you're consenting to being governed. It's just that you're voting in self-defense. And, and Lysander Spooner, he was saying that if if you know you're thrown into a battlefield, you're you're killing people not because you like to kill people, but because so you don't get killed yourself, right? So in self-defense, you're killing people, which is um, 
It's interesting, but but still, I mean, we don't have to participate. Like you know, like you know, when you're in the battlefield, okay, if somebody's shooting at you, you, you don't have much of a choice. But if you're you know in living in our society, you can opt out. You know, you can be more agorist in your you know interactions. You can you know deal more precious metals in Bitcoin, right? You can um, you know deal more off the books and things like that. Starve the beast as much as we can. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, once you start compromising your principles. And voting for politicians in order to get you know whipped a little bit less, <laughs> right? You go down a path that so many people have gone down. And when in history has such actions ever led to actual freedom? <laughs> like if, if voting, if voting could actually change anything, it would be made illegal. <laughs> yeah, right. Emma Goldman said that. Like years, and, and never be never be deceived by. By the by, don't ever believe that rich people will, will ever allow you to vote away their wealth. That was Lucy Parsons, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you voting isn't going to change shit. And the fact that most people, ironically, believe that this is a democracy, right? And yet, only thirty to forty percent, thirty-four to forty percent of the voting populace actually shows up to vote, and they're not like, well, this election doesn't count because. The majority of the people didn't show up. And even if the majority, say 50 percent of the people showed up, they're not all voting for the same candidate. So whatever candidate actually <laughs> wins hasn't won anything because the vote is invalid because the majority of the people who could vote didn't show up to vote. So this isn't a democracy. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it, it should be blatantly obvious to anybody who has ever paid attention to anything, right? And then Obama's talking about making the vote mandatory. Yeah, like that's that idea. spells freedom, everyone. <laughs> mandatory voting. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. people signing this shit. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> um, yeah. I remember my uh, when, when that came up, and I, I mentioned that to my my family member, who is a big time socialist. Um, she was ecstatic that <laughs> Obama mentioned about mandatory voting. And I'm like, the first thing I, I ask is, okay, what happens if someone does not want to vote? And they're like, they, they don't want to consider that, right? They're like, no, you just, it's just good to vote. Your civic, to do, your civic duty, you're, you know, contributing to society. You have to, you have to, you know, voice your opinion, all that kind of crap. And, uh, and and that's the first thing I ask. What if you don't want to vote? Okay, you get fined. What if you don't pay the fine? You know, it, it escalates, right? And is that really necessary? And is that equal to freedom? You know, I really don't think so. <laughs> no, I, I love it when people, you know, especially like older black people, you know, my parents, well, one of my parents, my mom, well, you know, a lot of people died for you to be able to vote. I'm like, actually... They didn't die for me to be able to vote. They died for me to be able to make the decision of whether I wanted to vote or not. That's why they died, right? Those who did die, right? So it, it wasn't an issue of, you know, oh, you have to go and vote because these people, that's, that's no, no. And that's, that's sunk cost fallacy, right? Just because these people died for me to be able to vote doesn't mean that me voting actually is something that's good. Like, you know, you got to know when to, Know when to hold them and know when to fold them, as they say, right? I went to the um, a Green Festival in in, in uh, celebration of Earth Day. And, you know, my family wanted to go, so I went and um, and and I, I saw this woman walking around with a big styrofoam man, you know. And I went up to talk to her, and I'm like, "What is that?" She's like, "Oh, we just got um, styrofoam uh, containers banned in the five boroughs in in Manhattan, in, in in New York City, right?" <laughs> And she was delighted, like, you know, hopefully we'll get them banned everywhere. <laughs> and, and of course, every time somebody says ban or prohibition or anything like that, first thing, my first thing I think about, I didn't get to talk, say it because I was distracted, but first thing I think about is what if a school still wants to use styrofoam? What are you going to do? <laughs> We're going to find it. You're going to bring out the principal in chains. <laughs> The 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 man that she was holding was made out of styrofoam. <laughs> That's the crazy part. Yeah, yeah. Right, you said she was holding a styrofoam man. Yeah, it's like it's like this huge thing that she made out of styrofoam. Yeah, it was like a styrofoam man, basically. Yeah, that's what it was. But it is, because that's the problem with the world. There's too much styrofoam. That's the problem. 
It's not the, uh, you know, not, not not the currency creation, not the counterfeiting, not the surveillance, not the not the drone strikes, not the wars, not the nuclear detonations. It's the styrofoam. <laughs> That's the problem. Oh man, that just made me really depressed. Thank you. I needed that. I was I was I was actually getting happy today. No. Yeah, I mean, I mean. Um... You know, I'm, I'm all about, you know, um, you know, doing things, you know, that are healthy. Like I'm an acupuncturist, herbalist and Eastern nutritionist. Right. So so I'm all about, you know, Eastern nutrition, holistic health and things like that. But um, that was before I studied volunteerism, actually. And then once I started studying more of, uh, you know, anarchism, a- anarcho-capitalism, volunteerism and, and learning about this stuff, it's not it's not so simple. Like, you know, just buy organic and you'll be fine. You know, it goes a little bit deeper because when you realize that. The organic label is itself a USDA um, label. You, right? have to pay, you have to pay to put that shit on your 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 product. Yeah, it's very expensive, and you know it entails a lot of paperwork. Um, and and again, it's a government agency uh, that that uh, distributes that label. So again, when in history has any government agency been dependable <laughs> in anything that it does? You know, and truthful and honest. And so when you realize that, you're like, wait a minute, it's not, it's not the perfect, uh, you know, thing to buy. <laughs> Look, it, you, you put it to people like this. If the government came out with a car tomorrow, would you buy it? No one would buy that fucking car. Mm-hmm. Not a single person, right? Um, and so, you know, it, it's funny you mentioned that you, you, you're an herbalist and, you know, I, I thought about your first question and how you became an anarchist, and, and I talked about the trauma of, of being injured. Um, you know, part of that was figuring out that human beings aren't supposed to live like this. How are we supposed to live? Okay, um, what are we supposed to eat? Even down to like just the, the basics of what it is that we're supposed to put in our bodies as as animals, as creatures on this planet, because just about every animal in the wild knows what the fuck it's supposed to eat. You don't see pandas like, well, you know, maybe I'll try to catch a gazelle today. No, no. <laughs> they're, they're sticking with the bamboo. That's what they go, that's their go-to. There's no questions about it, right? There's no guesswork in it. And they just, that's they know what they're supposed We don't know what the fuck we're supposed to eat as animals on this planet. You know, we, we are, we're giving our kids shit in bags that is, that is colors that nature can never produce on its own. And... And, and, you know, it's got all these chemicals in it. And we're scarfing this stuff down like it's going out of style. And so, like, you know, for me, I was like, you know, okay, I need to eat organic. I need to eat this. And I went and bought a juicer and a blender and I started juicing, you know, organic greens. And and I felt great. And I was like, but I just spent $250 on greens, like <laughs> on leaves, like kale. That is it's fucking kale. It's dino kale. This isn't this isn't like you know some exotic shit. And so, <laughs> and so I'm like, you know, there has to be a better way. Like I could, if I had some land, I could grow my own food. And then I started looking into like, okay, well, where can I live? Where I can where I can build my own house how I want to. And grow my own food. And there's really nowhere where government isn't going to fuck with you on how you build your house, and which means you got to pay more money for for architects and engineers and tradesmen that are that are licensed and bonded and unionized. And it's just like, <laughs> oh, my God, we're safe. And even if you did buy the land and you pay for it outright, you have to keep working because you have to make money. Because if you don't pay the taxes on that land, what happens then, Nilo? The government says, you know what? You can have it. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> you, you, you seem to be doing well out there. Go ahead. Just keep it. Keep going. You seem like a nice guy. We'll give it to you. <laughs> yeah, right. We won't come out there and bother you at all. <laughs> yeah. So, so why don't you – this is a good transition to the um, – you know, your, your, your uh, schooling in the um, – you know, in New Mexico – um, right. So uh, so that was that was part of it, like wanting to get out of the city and have land and grow food and be healthy and be sort of the, the best me that I could be. Uh, Stefan, I mean, uh, Stefan Molino recently had on uh, uh, Elliot Hulse, which is like I, I love this guy. I watch his stuff all the time. Um, 
if you get a chance, you haven't checked them out, check them out. But uh, he talks about becoming your best self. And, and so like wanting to do that, wanting to be out in nature and be a part of nature um, and not have a huge impact on the planet. Cause I was all hippy dippy as far as like, you know, wanting to, you know, save the environment before I realized that eh, this shit can be fixed. And you just throw some fungus on it. It'll fix it all. Uh, <laughs> Seriously, Paul Stamets is just like just throw yeah, gold on it. Paul Stamets, that's good. That guy's awesome. I follow him too. <laughs> yeah, just throw some fungus on it. It'll be good. We're good. Um, but I, uh, I got into Earthships. Uh, a friend of mine was like, "Hey, Kyron, all the stuff you talk about, freedom and rainwater and collecting your own water and and living off the land, you should check out Earthship." So I started watching videos about them. Watch every single video I think on YouTube. YouTube has ever had to offer at least four times. Um, and I went out to the Earthship Academy. They actually started up an academy in the last couple of years where people can come out uh, to uh, Earthship Center, sort of like uh, Earthship Biotecture out in Taos, New Mexico, and, and learn how to build Earthships. You know, pound tires, uh, which is basically fill the tires with earth and and just pound them and, and create a, a, a brick out of a tire. Uh, you put cardboard in the bottom, of course, so the earth doesn't fall through. And uh, you, know, you build up a house, essentially. Uh, and this house collects its own rainwater. It, it uses that rainwater to shower. Then you use that shower water to water plants. The, the water in that planter is then used to flush the toilet. The toilet water goes out to the septic. The septic overflows into another botanical cell outside, and you grow food in that botanical cell. And and then, you know, some people have even gotten crafty and started using the water from the botanical cell outside to then reroute into the planter back inside. But you can't do that, so don't tell nobody that people <laughs> <laughs> but but I've also seen another guy who takes that water from the from the outside botanical cell and uses it to like water the other plants that ha that aren't in that botanical cell. So there's so many things that you can do as as far as that. Uh, it uses water four times. Uses you know recycled materials, uh, bottles, tires, and cans. A lot of concrete, unfortunately. But you know if you build a house and you don't have to do any repairs on it and don't have to tear it down. It's going to be there for 300 years. The fuck's a little concrete, right? Plant some trees. You'll be good, right? Mm -hmm. Or some hemp. Uh, but you can't do that, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I ended up going out there and, 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 and absolutely loving Earthships. Uh, would, would love to build a lot more of them. I actually would love to build 33 Earthships in my whole lifetime. Uh, but, you know, it was. I went to a, a workshop. Uh, uh, what do they call it? Yeah, basically a workshop out in Philadelphia, where the the guy who came up with the technique, Michael Reynolds, he uh, he talked about this one Earthship build that they did in Haiti after the earthquake there, and you know he, he only spent like forty five hundred to build this one Earthship. But it collected rainwater, treated it, used it, you know, used the shower water, the shower water to grow plants, used the the sewer, uh, the black water to grow plants. And he talked about this this very simple 12 foot diameter hut that he that they had built out of tires and pounded earth. And he talked about it, and it made so much sense to me. And to paraphrase him, he said, you know, I spent the last 30 years trying to build paradise in a house when all I had to do was build a house in paradise. And so for me, like, you know, I, uh, I have been looking very much at, at, at living in the tropics. And so I, you know, I spent some time in Mexico for the last, you know, couple months down there, just cruising around and seeing what, what it is. So how was, how, how was, uh, you know, in, in Acapulco, right? How, yeah. How did that go? So, you know, because, because I was down there, in uh in Oaxaca, Mexico, I decided to go up to Anarchopoco and uh and and see all the crazy anarchists and <laughs> that decided to come down there. Um and uh, Anarchopoco was was amazing. It was it was a lot of people uh it was very Bitcoin centric, right? I think that uh if 
if you're right, like, you know, we have to use the, the means possible to really uh, accentuate freedom. And, and I believe one of those best means is to change the currency and change how we deal with currency. I have Bitcoin. I accept Bitcoin uh, for for just being handsome. But <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you want to give me Bitcoin, but uh, I, I will I use Bitcoin if I get the opportunity, uh, which I think that's I think that's really where the the rubber is having a hard time in the road is that a lot of people aren't able to people aren't accepting Bitcoin because they're not, I guess, entrepreneurial and, and, and oriented towards towards doing that. Yeah, I have a I have a Bitcoin account, um, but uh, not 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 too much in there. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely you're right. You know, the first you know when you look in history, the first thing that that uh, governments often uh, hijack is the currency or the or the money. You know, and then it becomes currency <laughs> once the governments hijack it. Right. And um, and then that's what really begins the authoritarianism, the uh, the tyranny, you know, all of the oppression that happens and, you know, then the laws come in and then, because once you can control the money, the money is the lifeblood of the economy, you know, and yeah. once that becomes corrupted and devalued and debauched, then people can, you know, that's what people transact in and once that is no longer reliable, that's it, <laughs> you know. The middle class gets destroyed. You know, the wealth transfers from the middle class, the industrious, to the to the uh, politically connected and, and the and the um, right. you know, the elite. So the parasite class, the parasite class, exactly. And then, you know, and, and that's the thing that um, no parasite can survive without the host, right? <laughs> so once the host is belly up, that's it. It's uh, revolution time. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, it's yeah. not the revolution that we want, right? Right. It's, it's the reactive revolution. And, and actually, you know, I've, I've gotten away from using the term revolution because all revolutions do is, is yeah. revolt. Yeah, you know, exactly. it's, just, exactly. it's just a circle. Sure. What, what I'm what I'm looking for, what I'm hoping for is, is a paradigm shift mm -hmm. and, and 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 just in thought and understanding. And, you know, I strive and struggle to make that paradigm shift happen and trying to engage uh, people uh, mostly online. Uh, with with thought provoking questions and and commentary, but unfortunately, you know, if logic worked on the illogical, <laughs> they wouldn't be illogical, right? So <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's <laughs> so, a paradox, right? <laughs> right, it is. It's just like, oh fuck, what am I doing? I'm so Sisyphus right now. I'm just pushing this huge rock up the hill, hoping that one day it will go over the other side. Um, but you know, it, it it's it's an uphill battle, but I mean, really, when you understand the, the vastness of the universe, and I was actually talking to somebody about this, like when you understand the vastness of the universe and how insignificant we are, like none of this really matters. Like uh, a comet twice the size of our planet could come crashing into it and blow us to smithereens and no one will ever know in the history of the universe that humans <laughs> ever existed. And no one will give a fuck. And like, and so, like, I just spend the time doing, you know, doing this, and like, hey, who knows? It might, we might actually make it through being human, right? <laughs> you're right. So. You're right. The there's, uh, you know, this is uh, we're surrounded by chaos and by and by disorder, like true chaos and disorder that we, right, yeah. that no no man made law can control. Um, that and uh, you think and you think having some people in charge will prevent? Yeah. Right. The sun from exploding. But you have to go out and vote and pay your taxes. <laughs> because the roads. We need roads. Because, we need roads. Because the roads. That's that's what we need. You know, if we don't uh, if we don't have the, the stolen money to, to build libraries, we're not going to have any books. We don't have, you know, the stolen money to... Because uh, kids are so reading these days when, <laughs> and from libraries, right? That's where they're getting all their books and information. Like, come on, man. <laughs> exactly, right? So let me ask you, how do you, how do you talk to people around you, like friends and family? about you know these concepts of liberty and volunteerism uh you know what i i feel like such a like weirdo outsider it's just like i just it's like i go into every conversation with a new person like all right don't don't talk talk about <laughs> the government don't talk about initiation of force or statism don't do it just keep it small talk and then they'll inevitably 
say some of the most ignorant shit and I'm just like, well, you know, actually, you know. <laughs> That's when you know the bomb is coming. Every conversation. That's when you know the bomb every- is coming. Well, actually. <laughs> actually. You know. Then you lay it on the them. I can't condone that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I um against some pretty fierce debates with my mother with my father with uh, my brother actually he's coming along he's uh he's ni- he's now he's 23 and he i would say he's like a volunteer in the making you know he's in that quest the face where he's asking me questions like you know why is why is 401k you know bad again why is taxes bad again just remind me again so i understand it you know <laughs> but um but other other of my family members are really resisting like my grandfather who's pretty bad pretty big socialist and, and democrat um mm-hmm. you know he, he he's against you know this is a kind of interesting he wrote a poem recently against the uh, Iraq war and then um and I thought you know I, you know my family, my mother says like isn't that wonderful I'm like yeah that's wonderful but wh- what's so special about the Iraq war like war is mass murder war is the health of the state you know I'm not just against the Iraq war I'm against mass murder in general war in general most wars are founded on lies and deception and propaganda <laughs> All wars. You know, I'm not. I'm not against Obama. I'm against the idea of having a ruler. <laughs> That's what I'm against. Right. I'm not racist. Yeah. I. Yeah. Like it in Obama. Like. Just, yeah. You know. You, you know. It's. Uh, it's so funny when people call me a conservative, racist <laughs> conservative. I'm like, are you serious? I grew up in Gary, Indiana. Like. The, I, I'm not rich. I don't. Why would I want to conserve this shit? Like, <laughs> this isn't a system that benefits me. Hello. Like, I'm not crazy. I'm. Just, I'm telling you all. Like, you can try to participate and change it from the inside, but like, it's not gonna happen. Like, you, you, there's too many checks and balances in a way. So, um, yeah, it's it, talking talking to to family members. Um, I've I've kind of like I'm like unofficially the food involuntarily the food in a sense. Uh, <laughs> the food means uh, family of of origin. It's an acronym, but so like defooing means like you just leave your family of origin because you know they they whatever they're philosophically or or they were just such assholes that you have to get away from them. And, mm-hmm. and so, uh, but like I, I've been sort of involuntarily the food from a, nobody calls me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody really talks to me anymore, so it, it's kind of uh, it's kind of nice that it it isn't that isn't the case because I've I, you know you get in a really sad dark place when you know your dad's telling you, oh well you know God killed all of these people because it was his creation to do so and and that's fine it's just like so like let me get this straight you worship an entity that would kill people. Well, you know, it's like an artist destroying his masterpiece. I'm like, so wait, you're you're saying millions of human lives are comparable to an artist destroying a piece of art? Are you fucking crazy? Do you realize how fucking crazy? Like, I'm your son. How did this happen? What the fuck? And it's just, and you're just like, you know, I just I'm going back in. I'm taking some more mushrooms. So, <laughs> so, so you grew up as a Christian. Um, I, I grew up, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's America. I'm black. Like we weren't Muslim. Um, <laughs> my dad went to prison, so that didn't happen. Yeah. Um, but, uh, we were raised as Christians. We would sit around and read the Bible, uh, uh every Sunday uh, at, it's at home, right? That was our church. We would actually read the Bible. And I think that's actually how I became an atheist. For some <laughs> reason, I find it interesting. <laughs> I was like, "This is some bullshit." Like, y'all believe y'all are believing this shit? And, <laughs> yeah, and I'm like looking around the table, my brothers, and they're not paying attention. They don't give a fuck. And I'm actually reading it. Like, this is some interesting bullshit. And uh, <laughs> and so, and my it was interesting. Now, and my dad accuses me of not reading the Bible, or understanding it, and so. I'm just like, I've read it, dude. I understand it better than most Christians. But for the most part, I don't really talk to my family and friends. Well, my family, my friends, they all understand it. Like, I don't really hang around with people who don't understand anarchism, who don't understand voluntary. It's just like, it's a waste of fucking time. Why would I invest in our friendship and you are voting to have people like me thrown in cages? 
for victimless crimes, right? I'm I'm all set. Like I don't need you as a friend. I'll be fine. Mm-hmm. Right? So so how do you um like if you do you encounter like people um you know on the street or you know in the grocery store or wh- wherever you are and you do you try to start a conversation with some people or do you avoid you know you don't like to broach the topic? Man, look, you know you ever been a six five black dude in America? Like I'm six five, like two hundred seventy five pounds. People aren't trying to engage with me on this. <laughs> they are they are trying to they are trying to survive the interaction. <laughs> They just keep their head down. I'm just going to walk through this. Uh, hopefully, he will not attack me. <laughs> Who let this gorilla off the leash? You just like, got to go up to him in, in the gentlest voice. Non-initiation of force. <laughs> Non-aggression. <laughs> People be like, is he, is, he, is he speaking African? I don't understand anything he just said. <laughs> you can't, most people don't. Like, most people don't read above a fifth grade level. Like... And so when you throwing out initiation of force, the monopoly on the initiation, statism, voluntarism, you throwing out these concepts, these words, they you might as well be speaking Swahili. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they don't give a fuck because they have the attention span of a goldfish because all they watch is Vine videos. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So it's just like, uh, fuck it. I just... <laughs> You yeah, know, yeah. Sit here. <laughs> <This> scale. <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I mean, the way I broach these topics sometimes is, um, you know, I, I start, you know, circuitously, I, I, you know, I start talking about um, my monetary system is my favorite, you know, economics or, or you know, I ask about colleges and you know, what are you studying? Are you are you in debt? You know, do you know what the national debt is? You know, do you know what fiat currency is? <laughs> do you know what the Federal Reserve is? <laughs> and I kind of Taxes. go. <laughs> Say again. Taxes. Great way to great way. Everybody agrees on taxes across the board. Yeah. Even if people are like, well, you know, taxes have to pay for the roads and this and that. You get them on the points where they disagree where taxes should be spent. Well, what do you think tax money shouldn't be spent? And you just nail that point home. It's easy to get them, you know, over to, you know, at least thinking about the concepts. But I've never had anybody say, you know what? You're absolutely right. Everything you said makes sense. I'm an anarchist. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> this, this has never fucking happened. I don't know if it's ever going to happen, but I, I think, you know, I've, I've planted enough seeds out there in the minds of enough people. And hopefully, you know, I, I just hope that I propagandize enough so that it just it just seeps in there somehow. Like something just sticks home with them and it's just like they can't shake the image. They can't shake the concept. And it just it rocks their world and they have no choice but to come, but to become a voluntarist, which I think is right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what you said before, you know, when, when you really internalize these concepts, you know, how can you go back to the way you were before? You know, it's just like when you discover slavery is immoral, how can you go back to, you know, being a slave master or supporting, you know, a government that supports slavery, right? How can you do that? <laughs> Well, I mean, it's easy when you're fucking the slaves. It's like, well, I gotta give up all this good slave pussy. Like, I can't. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> and so, like, <laughs> so, like, whenever, whenever I see white dudes like quoting Thomas Jefferson and like he's their hero and shit, I'm just like, oh, so you like black women, huh? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> right. You've always just wanted a black woman. Without actually having to deal with a black woman, yeah. there's a, there's a, a debate that I did with a, with an old friend of mine, a uh, status friend, and uh, you know he was a proponent of uh, direct democracy. You know, basically, you know, uh, uh, mob rule. Yeah, basically, and um, and we were talking about slavery, and, and kind of interesting. He's he's basically saying, you know, if there was no government, there, you know, like businesses would band together buy you know buy weapons and buy tanks and you know force them force the customers to buy their products <laughs> and and i'm saying first of all two things what, number one uh that's that's a pretty inefficient business model you know and it already occurs today that's called government right <laughs> they make crappy products and they force you to buy them at gunpoint right and and number two how expensive would it be like we're talking about slavery like like he's like you, people did slavery because it was profitable, and I'm like, what? Profitable? Are you serious? It's profitable to 
to force, you know, subjugate someone, whip them, you know, enslave them, feed them, clothe them, house them, you know, it's profitable. That's, (laughs) and he couldn't, he's like, yeah, if I have a slave, he just, I'm just going to give him bread and water and put him in a mud hut. (laughs) He actually said that. It's kind of funny. And I'm like, wait a minute. So how would your, your, your health of your bread and water slave be? (laughs) Like, (laughs) He won't be able to produce anything. You has got to be told so many inputs just to keep him alive. It's kind of funny. <laughs> Have you ever? Well, gotten- you know, I, there was this comedian. Uh, we talked about Steve Hughes, and he was like, "Jobs are like that's how they keep you distracted and and tired, too tired to be able to think philosophically, rationally about your reality." I mean, just r- really, basically, basically, what Stefan Molyneux said is, is that we're free range slaves. And so, like, we don't, like, we have to take care of all the things that Master had to take care of before, and Master now gets all the benefits, and we, on the other hand, have to take care of our housing, take care of this, and take care of that, and, and like, you know, I've heard, I've heard some racist white people say, well, black people had it better on the plantation. I'm like, actually, these motherfuckers ain't too, they're not too fucking wrong about that. <laughs> They had job. Everybody had a job on the plantation. Full, <laughs> yeah, full, full employment, right? <laughs> full employment on the plantation. <laughs> Everybody ate. There's nobody went hungry on the plantation. <laughs> and, and that's the other crazy thing is is uh, you know in our society, like let's say a, a person uh, murders someone, you know the in our our current justice system, the way they respond is the people who the family who you know of, this, of the murdered person has to pay for that person through taxes to be right to be clothed housed you know have security have food <laughs> no it's funny i i mentioned this very point i mentioned this very point i've mentioned it before on, on shows on, on voluntary virtues uh round table uh my brother was murdered right um some 11 years ago and you know i tell people the injustice wasn't that you know my brother was murdered and justice is is that my mother and you know my family who lives here and his all my brother's friends and and have to pay for the guy who murdered my brother to be you know taken care of for the rest of his life like that's the injustice that that is the that is the injustice right because you know that why should i have to pay for this guy being a fuck up Right. So, you know, <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and the guy who I was talking to, actually, he has a son that has the almost the reverse name of mine. It was crazy. We had a crazy conversation, met him randomly in a parking lot. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so, you know, he uh, he was he was vibing <clears throat> with everything that I was saying. And so it was one of those rare situations in which somebody was actually like, no, you're not you're not crazy. That actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, so it was. Uh, I was just bringing that up just yesterday. That you know, you have to pay for your murderer. Your family has to pay for your murderer to be taken care of for the rest of their life. In this paradigm, that's crazy. That's not justice. Has to. There's no you. There's no option. You can't be like, I'm not paying that tax. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the difference between um, restitution and retribution, right? It's the difference between you know re- rewarding. The criminal or making the victim whole and you know obviously with a you know with other other crimes you know like theft and assault and rape you can sort of make the person whole you know paying for medical expenses and lost time at work and uh you know emotional you know um damage things like that but you know murder how can you how can you make the person whole you can't but you can you can sort of you know help out the family member all that all that you know same same sort of thing um or you know give a mon- monetary um you know it's, it's kind of it's kind of uh uh, difficult to assign a monetary value on a human life, but but that's kind of the market way of restoring you know the person rather than um, rewarding the criminal, <laughs> which is what we do today. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and I think about I'm thinking about this concept of of like how much money would you actually need to make if you are a person and you have your own land. And everybody can grow food because the government isn't like they'll do it like they've done in Tulsa, Oklahoma or in Florida. Come in and like or or Michigan come in and destroy your garden or come in and arrest you for having chickens. And 
mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and and force you to, to tear up your guard in order for you not to go to jail? It, what if everybody could grow their own food? What if everybody's house was built from the materials that were on their land? How much money would you actually have to make a year, right? Uh, and, and I'm not saying that we should all go back to some sort of Neolithic barter, homesteading, you know, home on a range existence. I mean, we fucking have computers and cars that go like really fucking fast. And we, why would we want to go back to that existence, right? Um, but what I'm saying is, is that we could do things extremely different to where money really isn't a huge issue. I mean, I often, I often tell people like, you know, one way I get people talk, going back to talking about how I talk to people about government is, uh, is, you know, if government was really there to protect you, look at, look at all these trees up and down the street, right? How many of them produce fruit? How many of them produce a nut, right? Something you can eat, something that, you know, is, has value, right? Oh, they produce air. Well, I mean, air is great, but there's plenty of air on this planet. Why don't these trees produce fruit? Aren't there hungry people in the city? Aren't there hungry people in the countryside? If government was really there to protect you and keep you safe and to help you, all of these trees should be producing fruit, right? (laughs) And so it's just like, imagine if, though, all of the trees in the city were producing fruit. What if, you know, instead of these huge parks and spaces that nobody fucking uses most of the time, they're, because their kids are locked up in school and government schools being brainwashed most of the day or you pay. Um, there was, there was food being grown out there. You know, it just, how, how amazing would that, would that world be? Right. It, it would, I think it would be pretty cool, but that's just me. That's a good idea. But the, the only problem with that is that th- that would uh, decrease the dependency of people on their EBT cards and food stamps and, you know, <laughs> and WIC, you know, installments, you know, so uh, <laughs> that's no good. No, we well, can't have that. Welfare is the worst thing that could ever happen to, to you. If you if you're on welfare, if you're accepting welfare and you're not an elite wealthy person raking in billions, uh, I would say try to get off of it as soon as possible. It creates a dependency that is it is it will destroy you it will destroy your people look at native americans look at black folks um it will it will fuck you up uh stay away from it <laughs> if if at all possible uh thomas i believe thomas soul said uh government steals your money secretly and gives it back to you flamboyantly yeah and like cool. it, it <laughs> It's just, it's just people are falling for straight okie doke. Like it's your own money. Like you shouldn't be excited to get your own money back. You should be pissed off. It was taken from you in the first place, and now you have all of these late fees and shit because you didn't have access to that money, mm-hmm. which more money is stolen from you. It's just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <sighs> when I go to the park, um, uh, and you know they have the signs that says, uh, "Don't feed the geese." Because it will interfere with their natural um, activities and it will make them uh, less able to take care of themselves and more dependent on you for food. <laughs> and whoever, whoever I'm with, if I see that sign, I say, you see that sign right there? That's what welfare does. <laughs> That's exactly what welfare does to people. <laughs> and the fucking <laughs> irony is, is that government put up the fucking sign. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> and, and so many people who support welfare, you know, they... You know, they say, you know, it's just don't be like that. It, you know, people just need it for a little while and then they get off of it. <laughs> I'm like, what, 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 what? <laughs> you're saying that you're saying that the um, the the per- percentage of people using welfare has been going down in the past few decades <laughs> or going up? Which one? <laughs> you know, um, so people have to realize, you know, human incentive, human human action. Like, if there's free stuff. Are people going to want to get more free stuff or less free stuff? <laughs> like, yeah. I don't have to work for this. It just comes to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I'll do that. <laughs> I'll do that. And uh, <laughs> and then and then you have uh, you know it's like is is it a wonder that you know the Democrats you know are are uh, 
appealing to the minorities and to the you know the immigrants and the illegals and you know the people in the slums and ghettos you know get them out to vote well who do you think they're going to vote for oh the guy who wants to give more free stuff okay <laughs> exactly you know? <laughs> you know and uh and and the republicans and the conservatives want to vote for the guys who's gonna cut their taxes and give them back subsidies you know for their corporations and businesses it's like you know, it's just it's just it's welfare all around. You just call it a different thing. Like you need an accountant to get your welfare, but you get it right. And, you know, it, it's 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 okie doke is what is what I like to call it. Like and everybody's fighting for the free stuff that they've been promised, but more than likely aren't going to get. Um, and it, it's so interesting. You talk about people of color and, you know, I think this is a great transition into um, Baltimore. And what's going on there with the riots and, and everything, uh, you know, there's a bunch of disenfranchised people that are that haven't had access to funds, that haven't had access to being able to make funds. Because even if a kid opens up a lemonade stand trying to be entrepreneurial, the police will come in and shut that shit down. Oh, you don't have code in the spread. You don't have, you know, the permits to be able to sell food on the street. And... <laughs> And like, you know, here's this little kid who's trying to be entrepreneurial and his spirit, his entrepreneurial spirit is just crushed in a moment. Right. And and then like he ends up being, you know, a drug dealer, which isn't a bad thing. Like they're not hurting their the people that are buying the drugs. The person that wanted the drugs wants the drugs and, you know, they have the drugs to sell and they're having voluntary interactions. They're not out there robbing their 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 clients because their client isn't going to come back to them. Mm -hmm. They have a voluntary interaction like like everybody else. So, you know, what's going on in Baltimore is, is just a reflection of, of too much government intervention, too much government policy. Uh, you know, everybody's talking about, well, these people are, are burning, burning down their own communities. Look, I'm all for private ownership. But nobody in that community that actually lives there actually owns any of the properties just about. You can go to just about any black neighborhood, any black community, any major city, and most of the people who live in those communities do not own the properties that they live in. Right? At all. And not that you can even own property in the U.S. anyway, because, again, if you stop paying your property tax, the government comes in and takes it from you. So can you say that you ever owned it? Never. Right. Yeah. So, you know, people are going to. Yeah, they're going to tear up their shit because, you know, you got them locked in a cage and, and you're killing them like for running. Like this dude, for all we know, the dude, uh, Freddie Gray, that, that was killed was just out for an afternoon jog <laughs> for a morning jog, whatever time. And the cops like broke his leg and then they broke his neck and he died in the hospital like. Yeah. And like, you know, people are upset. People are frustrated. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, it may not be the best reaction. I, I wish it was more of a thought out uh, thing. Uh, response. I, I really hate to see uh, private property being destroyed. I hate to see people losing their lives. Uh, but like, you know, people are like, well, these kids are thugs. It's like you force them into government schools where they can't leave for <laughs> For like their whole lives, <laughs> and like you expect them to re have any other reaction than the reaction that they've been taught their whole life, it's it's only force, right? If they try to escape from school, what happens? A truancy officer comes, scoops them up, and puts them back in school, right? With cops, and if it keeps happening, the police are going to come to their to their house and they're going to arrest the parents, right? And, and it's just like. You're, you're, we're talking about force here. And so these kids are, are reacting in the only way that they've been taught how to act. Stefan Malano, I think he said it brilliantly. Children are a mirror. They hold up a mirror to how it is, how what, what reality is, what you're actually, who you are, who we are as adults, who we are as a society. And, you know, and instead of like, dealing with that issue and addressing what it is that we actually are and how the society is structured, <clears throat> we just drug the fuck out of them. And then when they come off the drugs, you know, 
they they kill they kill themselves a lot of times. They kill other people sometimes. You know, it it it, it is uh it's it's really unfortunate uh the whole situation. Uh, one of the, one of the situations in, in speaking of the children, right? One of the situations in Baltimore, there was a mother, right? And she's grabbing her son who's out there rioting and protesting. We don't, we don't know, right? Her son's just out there. He's got on a hoodie. He's got on a mask. And she sees her son and grabs him. And she starts, like, smacking him in front of CNN cameras, right? Now, this lady's <clears throat> got at least $500 worth of hair extensions in her hair. That she sm- <laughs> like, easily 500 like easily $500 worth of hair extensions in her hair. Uh, brand new clothes. Um, gold everywhere, uh, design fashion shoes, and she's smacking her kid. And, I, and I'm like, you know, imagine if this kid, if instead of you spending all of that money on these frivolous things, you were buying this kid an AR-15 and having him go to the range, right? You were giving him ammo. You were teaching him uh, combat formations, you know, with this money that you're spending. Imagine if all the parents in your neighborhood were doing the same thing, right? And if some shit like this happened with the police killing one of them, they're out there, everybody's got an AR-15 walking up and down the street. Do you think the police would be out there brutalizing you all at a moment's notice? You all are military, essentially military trained, right? And you're 15, 16 with nothing else to do besides walk up and down the street with AR-15s? Police aren't going to fuck with you. Then They're just not. They're not going to come into your communities like that. And, you know, I, I'm really excited about this uh, this uh, ghost gunner. I, I'm kind of, I don't know how the fuck I missed it, but uh, it, I, I'm excited about it. Like, I already knew before you could you could do it with a drill and, and, uh, and a, what do you call it, a, a router, a uh, router. It's a tool. It, it, it uh, it's basically it spins around a drill. But you, you can make a, a AR-15 lower receiver. You can buy 80 percent finished uh, AR-15 lower receiver online. Anybody can buy it. And in order to make it into a lower receiver, you actually have to be able to have a gun. But <clears throat> legally in the United States, right? If they if they're giving you permission, which you already have permission, but it's a that's a whole nother conversation. Um, Dark uh, Defense Distributed has made this machine in which you could put in an eighty percent lower receiver and have it completely like turned into an AR fifteen lower receiver, completed in about an hour, and making it to a weapon, a, a fireable weapon, and about another hour. And so imagine if, you know, one of these gets in the hands of these kids, you know, I'm not saying that they should, unless you are legally capable, legally capable to do so. Not that, you know, other people in in costumes and badges should be able to tell you what you could do as long as what you're doing isn't hurting or harming anyone. But imagine if everybody in the hood in, in the, in black neighborhoods had AR 15, and 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 walk down the street with them during you know during these events or or just protected their neighborhood to where hey look police we don't need you don't come in here right yeah there's no crime here we're good all right we'll call you if anything happens all right <laughs> we'll call you <laughs> <laughs> which we won't because we don't fucking need you uh, that 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 is I think that is going to completely change. The paradigm, well, they'll be using it to kill themselves and kill each other. Sure, that shit's going to happen. That shit happens now, right? White people kill each other, too. Actually, most murders happen intraracially. Like, it's, if somebody white is killed, it's probably somebody white who killed them. An Indian or, or Asian or black, it's usually by the same person, uh, somebody of their same, you know, quote unquote, race. Mm. So, you know, for, you know, for, so people would say, well, they'll kill themselves. So that's, that's bullshit. That's a bullshit argument. Um, and and two, like, you know, if, if you can walk down the street with a gun, why shouldn't I be allowed to? Is it because I'm a thug? Is, is that? Yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah. I'm really I'm really excited about the technology and I hope it gets out there. Unfortunately, they're railroading the fuck out of uh, Cody Wilson and his company. Right. They're not allowing the the machines that can carve out the a, uh, ARs. FedEx isn't shipping. They won't ship his stuff. Wow, really? They won't ship it. Oh, because they're working in collusion with the with the government, right? So even though they ship guns, even though they ship guns, mm-hmm. you know, FedEx ships guns, but you can't ship a machine that can make guns, but it isn't designed specifically to make guns. It can make anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, it's it's a it's it's a powerful it's powerful technology, and you know, I'm, I I see it creating a lot of change as far as how people interact with the state, how the state interacts with people. Um, and I, I, I think they're running scared. I mean, there's 5,000 troops right now in Baltimore. I don't know if you got the memo on that or heard, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's basically martial law. Even and it is martial law. I'm not going to say basically, right. Even though they say, Oh, we can never, this isn't, they're saying that this isn't martial law and it's so clearly fucking martial law. We're, we're not in control. We're working in conjunction with there's 5,000 troops in the city mm-hmm. policing the people. That's martial law. I mean, you can try to, like, back alley that shit and say, oh, well, the sheriff's in charge of the code. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it is definitely uh, crazy. True chaos. True, <laughs> true disorder, right? <laughs> true violence. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. so, so I don't want to keep you too much longer, but I just want to, I just want to mention also about the, uh, the rioting that kind of reminds me of a video I saw on the Ferguson riot when I, um, you, know, you see, you see these kids, uh, you know, um, looting and, and destroying windows and, and stealing merchandise. And then, and then you see, um, you know, yeah, mostly black kids. Right. And, and then you see a black storm coming out, this guy, he's like, he's like, what the hell are you guys doing? I didn't have anything to do with this. Why are you destroying my store? You know, I built this store after many, many years with my own, you know, capital and hard work. And you're just destroying it. You're not doing anything productive. You're just destroying. It's just outright destruction and violence. It has no productive end. And it it is actually destructive, right? Destroys value. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. this is... uh, this is what people have to keep in mind when they when they see protest protesters and looters and you know people who are um, resisting that way that it, there is no way that that can have a net benefit you know net positive at, at all and yeah. so when people say that you know you're absolutely right I, I tell them that like look if your mother owned the house next to the store that burned down your mother's house now you all have lost forty fifty thousand dollars of value in your home. Just because it's next to this burned down store or whatever, right? No one wants to live next to that. So, you know, but therein lies the issue, right? These people aren't allowed, and I say these people because I can do that. Fuck you. I'm black, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> my people aren't allowed typically to own homes in, 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 urban, in urban complexes, right? And so, because they don't own them, you know, they don't give a fuck what happens in those neighborhoods, right? You know, the best way to make sure people take care of things is to give them ownership of it. Yep, classic tragedy of the commons. Are you? Yep. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, so um, thank you very much, um, Kyron, for the conversation. Uh, it was awesome. So, is, is there any last message that you want to give to people? Um, you know, if you if you would sum up your philosophy and and what uh, you know the things that you've learned, what, what would you say to people? as a message uh <clears throat> let's see uh i would say love grow some food go to the beach everything makes sense in the water um i, I you know i subscribe to the aquatic ape theory uh i think you know i got high on mushrooms one time and and you know i was i was discombobulated and i just took off all my clothes and went and sat in a, in a lake in maine and everything made sense, even though there was like little crayfish, the fish biting at me and trying to eat me <laughs> like everything, everything made sense in the water. I mean, I didn't have to get out the water to go to the bathroom. <laughs> it just all made sense there. Right. And so <laughs> everything makes sense in the water. I think one of the the craziest things 
is is that we left the beach and and I think human beings are like I said aquatic animals and and to touch on domestication I remember on uh that guy Teague's episode you all talked about the domestication of, of animals uh there's this crazy experiment a silver fox experiment in in Russia and 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 so they've studied how to make these animals more docile so that they can get the fur off of them but in the process of domestication um, they, it changed the whole like way that the foxes look. And so like, it's crazy. This is just some random fox farm in the middle of Siberia. Yet, if you look it up, there's all of these governments and corporations and things that are funding this experiment to understand domestication, right? The dog that we have, the, the, the wolves that we have, we call them dogs, <coughs> are actually just adult puppies. And so um, they they are. And, 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 and that's why they bark. A bark is just like a puppy yelp. And so uh, wolves don't bark at all. Yeah. And so the way you domesticate an animal is to keep it in a childlike state. Right. And so a lot of people are walking around here in a childlike state because they're dependent on the government. Break your dependence from government. Rewild yourself. Get out in nature, um, climb a tree, you know, run real fast barefoot, like do get in touch with nature. Like you're not supposed to live in a, in a, in a fucking box. <laughs> you know, these are human nest boxes, right? Get out, get out in nature. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I would say. Get, get out, escape, rewild. Excellent. Nice advice. I, I love it. <laughs> I totally agree. So thank you very much, Kyron. Awesome conversation. Um, so this is uh, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theconsciousresistance.com. And you can also find me on theseedsofliberty.com on um, iTunes and Stitcher. And you can donate. Uh, feel free to give some uh, fiat love or Bitcoin, you know, um, if or through PayPal. Uh, whichever way you can get fiat, I would appreciate it and I will most certainly use it. <laughs> so thank you very much for listening. Um, have yourselves a wonderful day. Take care. Thank you for having me on, Danilo. Uh, no problem. Take care. Bye. <laughs>